Hey guys, Jerry Berg, The Poor Historian, and I am coming at you with a topic that I've seen in a few videos lately that I wanted to, ta to talk about a little bit. I do want to give two warnings first. Uh, first is that this is not necessarily an informative video, um, but more so a precautionary video, something that I've seen a lot lately and I want to talk a bit about it. And the second thing is that the era that we're going to be talking about, which is the uh, 17th and 18th century, is not an era that I consider myself especially uh, informed in, uh, but the era beforehand, the 1500s, and the era afterward, the, 9th, the 1800s, uh, I do have a lot of experience with, and I think that is relevant to the topic we're talking about, because the topic we're talking about the very end of the military, the so-called military revolution is about the downfall of the pike and its replacement uh, with a type of weapon called the plug bayonet. Now, to explain what a plug bayonet is, this is a replica here, um, and I'm going to be using a replica Civil War musket because that's the closest thing that I have here in the house. Um, a plug bayonet is essentially a knife or a blade or eventually a um, poking device. Uh, that you would attach to the end of your musket to essentially remove the musket or arquebus or other fire early firearm its ability to shoot and replacing it with uh, a spear point essentially turning your firearm into a spear which you could then use to charge your enemy ranks defend yourself in hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, and, and all sorts of intimidation techniques as well the issue arises when you hear people talk about the plug bayonet as a replacement for the earlier most popular weapon on the battlefield, the pike. And of course I don't have any full length pikes here with me, uh, but I do have a visually this winged spear, very dirty, but you can't even see the top of it on top of the screen, so it won't really, really matter. Uh, this one here is about 9 feet tall. A true pike would be 16 to 21 feet tall roughly. And the idea of the pike is it came around in the 1500s or late 1400s and combining this extra long pole with the spear point on the end with well-drilled military formations will allow you to create a near impenetrable wall of spears very very simply put and it also led to the downfall of the mounted or armored knight uh, in part so with that it became the most popular weapon on the battlefield for much of the 16th century and into the 17th century. So the issue that I've, that I've seen online with videos is that people will say that the plug bayonet rendered the pike useless uh, on the battlefield. And that, that causes an issue because it, it grossly oversimplifies a military transition in, in mindset and technology of the time. Uh, you can read a lot about this, about the uh, hotly debated military revolution topic. There are lots of books on it. Um, but I do want to point out that the role of the pike on the battlefield really was not able to be supplanted by the concept of putting a, a knife in the end of your musket. You know, it, it, it's entirely different, and it is not a clear transition of, oh, look, we can put a blade at the end of our gun, and now we don't need to have our pikes on here. Uh, it just simply is not able to replace the role of the heavy, impenetrable infantry line uh, that you'd see on the battlefield in the late 1500s and the early 1600s. Um, instead, what you get into is a much more complicated role, uh, or a much more complicated topic that is the role of the pike in the early modern battlefields, the late early modern, the, the 1600s and into the 1700s, where pikes were still an important part of uh, military at the time, and in fact, pikes were still used by militaries into the 19th century during the Napoleonic Wars, even the American Civil War, um, and uh, uh, arguably you could even say their role in World War One, World War II for home guards, uh, but that's a different topic. Nonetheless, the plug bayonet was not able to just go, this, this, this revelation, uh, some general out there went, wait a minute, we can put a knife at the end of our gun and now we don't need pikes, we can just arm everyone with guns. It instead is a much more complicated transition of the military of the time, figuring out what to do with this, you know, these hundreds of soldiers, the hundreds of thousands of soldiers that are armed with pikes, drilled with pikes, that were still a very important part of the military, because if you removed them and replaced them with more heavily armored knights in a more medieval setting, um, 
there's a chance that that old concept would return. So more, very, very simply put, the pikes were still kept on there, one, for traditional reasons, and two, as a, as a careful, you know, just in case someone came by with heavy cavalry. But as, ca as heavy cavalry um, had a downfall or was replaced with light cavalry, that was more for mopping up and screening techniques rather than a straight-on heavy cavalry charge, the pike's role and usefulness on the battlefield was diminished as well as the idea of maybe if we had a gun that could fire hundreds of yards away uh, and could puncture through almost any plate armor that you throw on there, maybe we don't necessarily need to have so many soldiers armed with a weapon that only had a range of up to 25 feet. Um, so, so I want to point out, so just to wrap this up and to keep this video short, I do want to clarify that the plug bayonet did not, quote, replace the pike. You cannot replace the pike with something that's maybe six feet tall. It just the the idea of using your plug bayonet as an anti cavalry is is almost laughable. Um, but what it did do was freed up a good portion of your fighting forces at the time to be able to also have the ability to fire a musket or arquebus or other firearm on the battlefield, adding to the amount of lead that gets flying towards your opponent, which in and of itself is a larger section of the military revolution too. So uh, this is just one example of uh, simplification uh, of tr the transition of military arms. And while I, I wasn't able to get into a lot of the details on this topic, I did want to at least talk to you guys about doing some, uh, not hearing this, sim not, not subscribing to the simplification of the transition of military history over time. It is a much more complicated beast than simply someone going, oh, I want to protect my hand more, so I'm going to put a complex grip on my rapier, you know, on my arming sword and get a rapier. It, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's, there's a lot of tra traditions that are involved. There's a lot of more complicated battlefield roles, uh, and especially the role of arming and supplying and the cost of battlefields um, or having battle ready armies rather than or standing armies rather than something that you would simply recruit from the time there's also the cost of manufacture there is a lot of additional things to include so please if you hear someone go you know this weapon led to this weapon the end and, and, and you realize it's just a giant transition on how military history worked <laughs> please take a pause and go well wait a minute maybe it's not that simple uh, I understand that some historians would like to simplify topics to to then go on and uh, be able to talk about another m topic that they're more interested in, but I at least mention that it is more complicated than simply this led to this, the end. So, in any case, hope you guys have a great day, and until the next time.